All right, I want to welcome everyone to the September 2022 meeting of the Para Club. And tonight we're very excited to have Dr. Stephanie Lamb with us. Uh, Dr. Lamb was a speaker for us previously in 2020, gave an excellent talk, and so we're very happy to have her again. She's a frequent speaker for Lefebvre on a number of topics, so I encourage everyone to check out her videos on the Lefebvre website and all the other great videos they have. And just very briefly, Dr. Lamb is board certified in avian medicine. She did some of her training in Connecticut at South Wilton Veterinary, which is how I first met her. And she subsequently has worked in California and now has a practice in Arizona, in addition to her very busy schedule giving talks. So tonight we're going to hear all about liver disease and nutraceuticals used for liver. This is a very common topic. I think most people at some point or another have or will have a bird that has liver problems. So I think it's really important that everybody learn some more about this. And we're probably going to have a lot of questions at the end. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to Dr. Lamb. All right, thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. We'll get my PowerPoint up. I apologize that for some reason, my uh, camera decided to stop working at the beginning of this, but that's okay, because as long as you guys can see the PowerPoint, we should be okay. So, all right. Um, so yeah, as, as Amy was mentioning, liver disease is a really important topic to discuss um, in when it comes to, to birds, because it is something that we really do see very frequently. Um, I know before I was a veterinarian, when I was um, a bird owner, um, and you know, before vet school, in vet school, um, I had a bird that had liver problems, and so you know, when I when I got into vet school, one of my interests was liver disease because I wanted to know more about it, um, and I really learned that there's there's quite a few birds out there that have liver problems, live with liver problems, um, and so we're going to get into all of that. So the first picture I have here is just a little anatomical layout of a bird. And it's trying to show us most of the major organs um, in a bird. If you were to do a necropsy and open the bird up and take a look on the inside to see all the different organs there are. The, starting at the top here, I think you guys can see my cursor okay. Um, coming down from the mouth, we have the trachea, and that's going into the lungs, which are tucked behind all these structures that you can't see very well. We have the esophagus coming down into the crop where it bulges out and they store their food before it goes further down into the proventriculus and then the ventriculus down here through the intestines. Here is the pancreas that's sitting um, between two loops of the small intestines. Um, when we go back up into more the thoracic region, we have our heart with the great vessels branching off. We have several important endocrine glands, glands that are important for controlling hormones. And then situated just below the heart and above the gastrointestinal tract on either side here, we have the liver. Um, the liver in birds is bilobed, meaning there's like two segments to it, a right lobe and a left lobe. And the right lobe is a little bit bigger than the left lobe, despite what this picture looks like. The picture makes it look like the left lobe is bigger than the right lobe, but in fact, the right lobe is actually the, the bigger um, of the two in birds. So that's what we are going to focus on today. And... The next thing we need to talk about regarding the liver is what is it actually doing? What is its importance in the body? It's kind of, again, situated right there between the heart and the gastrointestinal tract. Why is it sitting there? What is it doing? Well, it has a lot of important functions and kind of where it's situated allows for it to really be involved in those important functions, with the biggest one being nutrient processing. So once you have food that comes in through the gastrointestinal tract, gets into those small intestines, that food ends up passing into the circulatory system and goes really straight to the liver. Um, all those nutrients are then processed and things are broken down. And in the, the breakdown of some of those nutrients, there are some toxins that are produce sort of as byproducts of uh, just nutrient breakdown, nutrient processing. And the liver has to recognize 
what things are potentially toxic and has to help sort of escort those things out of the body correctly. Um, and it does that, you know, through uh, one of the things um, of uh, producing bile, uh, but bile is not only important uh, for that, it's also important for the absorption of fats and fat soluble vitamins from the gastrointestinal tract. The liver also produces clotting factors that are important for, for the blood. If we have a liver that's not functioning appropriately, the animal may not make appropriate clotting factors. And if it doesn't make those clotting factors well, then if there is a cut or a wound on the bird, it may not clot its blood well, and it could potentially bleed. And, and in some cases, when we have really small birds, um, something like that can even be life-threatening because they don't have a lot of blood to lose. So uh, really important in, in that function within the body. The liver also produces albumin protein, and albumin is a protein that's actually within the blood, and it's important at maintaining normal uh, fluid within the blood. And so if you think about your vascular system, you have red blood cells inside the blood, white blood cells, you have platelets, which in birds are called thrombocytes, and then you have all this fluid um, that's composed of lots of different things. It has albumin proteins, it has um, different electrolytes, it has hormones. I mean, the, the vascular system really is this, you know, highway and conduit to get things throughout the body to different organs and different cells. And it's really important that you have normal like just water and fluid within the vascular system. And that albumin protein is important for keeping um, normal, normal fluid within that vascular space. Um, the liver is also important because it stores glucose, it stores vitamins, it stores minerals for use later um, and in other uh, cells and other organs when, when they are in need. It also produces cholesterol. And a lot of times people hear the word cholesterol and they automatically think that cholesterol is bad. But cholesterol is, you know, when you have too much of it, it can be bad, of course. But too little of it can be bad as well. Cholesterol is really important because it's a precursor to a lot of our hormones in the body. Um, so it does have good functions. It also, the liver is important for converting thyroid hormone to the functional uh, form of thyroid. And then it is important for, uh, important in the immune system because of processing things that are coming from the gut. We do have a lot of, and birds have a lot of little microorganisms living in their gut, things that could potentially be coming in to the body. And the liver has to, again, sort of sort through things and go, is this appropriate to be here or do we need to get rid of this in some way? So as you can see, it's quite a few functions that that, that liver has. So um, it's when it doesn't work the way that it's supposed to, it can be really detrimental. Now, when I mentioned at the beginning how liver disease is a common problem in birds, I didn't really say, you know, why or what sort of liver diseases we see. We, we do see lots of liver disease in birds, but the reality is there's lots of different types of liver problems. There's not just one liver disease that's out there. So when you hear somebody say, you know, oh, my bird has liver disease, the, the next question should be, well, what, what's actually wrong with the liver? What's going on with it? Why do you have a liver problem? And that's really what the veterinarian is often trying to figure out. Um, now, as far as things that can go wrong with the liver, they are quite numerous, but the more common things that we could potentially see that could lead to um, liver issues with birds, by and far the most common thing is fatty liver syndrome. It also goes by the name of hepatic lipidosis, so you could hear it either way, um, either is appropriate, an appropriate term for, for use at this time. Um, but they mean the same thing. Basically what it is, is there's a buildup of fat within the liver and then it doesn't make the liver function as well as it's supposed to because all those other functions that the liver is supposed to be doing are getting sort of, um, well, they're not happening as well as they, they should be. Uh, and so then you can start to see various problems from 
those functions not occurring the way that they should. Infectious diseases are also really common. Um, and I've listed a variety of different infectious diseases, but when we think about infectious diseases, there's four main major groups of infectious diseases, viral, bacterial, fungal, and parasitic. And when it comes to diseases that end up affecting the liver, I have to say that uh, viral and bacterial are the more common ones that we will see in birds. Fungal disorders do happen with the liver, but really I have to say very infrequently that they affect the liver primarily. You may see uh, patients that birds that have liver problems may go on to have fungal infections elsewhere. Like if you have a bird that has liver disease for one reason, um, it may not be as having as appropriate functioning of an immune system. And then because of that, they end up getting like a secondary uh, fungal infection within the gastrointestinal tract. So you may sometimes see things together, but as far as fungal organisms directly affecting the liver, not to say they can't happen, they just don't happen super frequently. And then the same thing with parasites. We don't see a lot of parasitic um, problems affecting the liver in our pet birds. Next thing um, is cancer. Unfortunately, cancer happens in all species. And we can have cancers that are primarily affecting the liver, so like hepatocellular carcinomas, or you can have cancers from other parts of the body metastasize to the liver. And when it comes to cancer, cancer, uh, two most common places that cancer likes to pop up in first, aside from the primary site, it's going to be either the liver or the lungs, and that's no different for birds. Um, the next thing is cirrhosis, and so cirrhosis is this like scarring that can happen with the liver. Now cirrhosis can happen after other problems occur. So like you could start off with some nasty bacterial infection that caused a lot of liver cell damage, and maybe the infection itself resolves, but then the body is trying to uh, heal itself. You're having some liver cells that are regenerating, but then you may also get some scar tissue. And depending upon how bad that scar tissue is, um, determines how much signs you could potentially see a bird showing with, uh, with that. And again, so scar tissue really is a cirrhosis of that liver. Uh, toxins are also common. So as I mentioned, toxins are filtered out by the liver. But at the same time, if you're taking in too many toxins, um, well, sometimes those toxins in going to that liver first, where the liver is supposed to help filter things out, sometimes they cause damage to the liver. Um, and so there are certain toxins that can be present in feed. Um, and thankfully, it's not a huge problem that we see in pet birds. It's more of a problem that you'll see in like chickens, where their food sometimes can get moldy and they'll be the production of this one particular toxin by fungal organism that is really damaging for the liver. You can also have congenital malformation. Sometimes the body doesn't develop the way that it's supposed to. Um, and so depending upon how things develop inappropriately um, could, could lead to different types of signs. Iron storage disease is also something that can occur with the liver. And so iron storage disease is when the body is having too much iron in it. And in people, and I'm not a, not a human doctor, obviously, um, but I believe in people, iron storage disease is usually a, a genetic problem. But in birds, we don't totally understand all the reasons why iron storage disease happens. We think it's because they're getting too much iron in the diet but there's also the possibility that it's a function of too much vitamin C in the diet. Vitamin C can lead to absorption of iron. Um, it may also be a function of them not having certain things in the diet that would prevent the absorption of iron. I put this picture up of this rainbow lorikeet because the species of parrot that's most commonly affected by iron storage disease are the, the lorikeets. Now you can see it in other species too, and interestingly, I have an African gray patient that has iron storage disease, um, but that's the first and only African gray patient that I've ever had. In the literature, there's one report of an um, individual that had 
three African greys that I believe, if I remember correctly, were all related. Um, and they went on to develop iron storage disease. So we don't totally understand it in birds, but basically what we do know is that there's too much iron in the body, that iron builds up in the liver, it can lead to tissue damage, scarring, um, fibrosis, sort of that cirrhosis end stage uh, can occur as well and can lead to horrible malfunction of the liver and, and ultimately death. Vacuolar hepatopathy is another common thing that we will see. And what, a, what, a, what that is, it's kind of a frustrating diagnosis that I'll sometimes get on a biopsy. It means that within the liver cells, if I take a biopsy from a bird to try to figure out why it's having liver problems, the pathologist who looks at that sample of that liver underneath the microscope will see within the liver cells, just these like big open spaces essentially. Um, and so the liver is not functioning normally when it has these big open spaces where nothing is in it, but it can happen for a variety of reasons and sort of a non-specific change. So when I end up getting that on a biopsy, I get really annoyed because it doesn't tell me exactly why that individual developed liver problems. It can be secondary to toxins. It can be secondary to certain nutrient imbalances. It can be secondary to previous infections. So it's a little bit of a frustrating diagnosis, but it is something that I get with some frequency on biopsies. And then heart failure is the other thing that we can see. And um, it's not so much that the liver is the primary problem in those cases. It's that the heart is not pumping blood around the body the way that it's supposed to. So again, that vascular space is sort of that conduit by which all different things get sent throughout the body, right? And so if that stuff is not getting pumped to, out to the body the way that it's supposed to, and things are getting sort of backed up within the vasculature, it can lead to what's called congestion when, within the liver, um, and fluid can kind of leak, leak out um, around the um, uh, liver cells and sort of out into the abdomen as well. So not a primary liver problem, but a secondary, a liver problem that happens secondary to something else. Okay, so what kind of signs can you see associated with liver disease? Well, there's a variety of different types of signs that can be present. And some of them are very nonspecific, which, make, which makes it really difficult, honestly, because it'd be nice if birds would just show one particular sign for one particular organ system that's affected, but that's just not the case. It's just not reality. Um, so we can see lots of different signs with one of the most common things just being lethargy. They're quiet. They're not acting like their normal selves where they used to be a rambunctious bird who was loud and crazy. Now they're sleeping more. Now they're just a little more subdued. You may also see things like anorexia or hyporexia. So anorexia is they're not eating at all. Hyporexia is that they're, they're eating some, but they're just not eating the way that they used to. Like they'll pick a little bit here and there, but they just don't have the appetite that they once did. You can also see things like vomiting or regurgitation. Vomiting and regurgitation are actually two different things. Sometimes it's hard to tell exactly which is happening, but vomiting is where they're actually bringing something up from the stomach. And that tends to be this more active process where they are um, really like bobbing their head up and down. You're seeing this really um, sort of dramatic movements of the body and then they suddenly open up their mouth and even fling uh, food all over the place. Whereas regurgitation is they're just more bringing it up from the crop, but because they're birds and birds can do that, um, it's, it's, uh, they can still do a little bit of head bobbing. So sometimes in birds, it's hard to tell the difference between regurgitation and vomiting. One of the things that I'll use, or at least attempt to use to tell is how much body movements are really getting into it. Is it like the full body that's brings, that allows them to bring stuff up or is it just kind of a little bit of head movement? So um, not that it matters too much, but because we can't see either of them um, for this problem, I should say. You can also see, weight changes. And the frustrating thing with liver disease is it can be either weight loss or weight gain. In that most common liver problem that we see, fatty liver syndrome in our pet parrots, it's usually weight gain is the most common thing. But if you've had a bird that's had fatty liver syndrome for a prolonged period of time, and then they're starting to get to the point where they've got scar tissue forming and they're getting fibrosis, well, then they might start losing weight. And so they really can present at either end of the spectrum.
As I mentioned, clotting disorders are something that we can see too. Again, that liver is important for the production of um, certain things that are involved in clotting the blood. And if a bird has liver, prop, liver disease and it's not able to clot its blood the way that it should, sometimes a little injury can result in massive blood loss, or sometimes even if they just bump themselves, they can get bruises. And where you'll see it most commonly, and I don't think I have a picture of it in this, in this um, series here, and I really need to get a good picture of it the next time I see it. I'm just sometimes bad about taking photos of things when I'm seeing patients, because I'm certainly much more focused on them than thinking about taking photos. Um, but where I will see it most commonly is in little budgies because I see a lot of budgies with liver disease and they will get this elongation to their beak. So their beak grows quicker than it's supposed to. And you'll also see these little striations within the beak where it just looks like the beak is more flaky than what it's supposed to be. And the other thing that you'll see is you'll see these little purple spots within the keratin of the beak or within the keratin of the nails. And those are little clots, little blood clots um, that are present there from them not clotting their blood appropriately. The next thing you could see is a distended abdomen. And that can be from two different reasons. You can have that abdomen be big because an organ is enlarged, like the liver itself could potentially be enlarged, or you could have it happen because fluid is building up. Again, that liver is really important for making that protein albumin that's within circulation in the blood. If it's not functioning well and you don't make albumin to the levels that you're supposed to, then fluid leaks out of vascular the vascular space and can be just more free in the abdomen. And so they'll have this free fluid in their belly. Um, that's just sitting there and that's something that you might be able to see. Now the only problem with the distended abdomen in birds is it can be very difficult for owners to notice it because of the fact that they have feathers on their abdomen and with those feathers on the abdomen it does make it um, sort of uh, hide any sort of distension in, until it's really advanced. You may also see respiratory distress, and that's not because of a primary respiratory problem. It's more because that organ enlargement or that fluid that can build up in the belly ends up putting pressure on the abdominal air sacs. And that pressure on the abdominal air sacs makes it so that it's a little harder for them to breathe. The next thing is urate color change. Okay, so when you look at the droppings of a bird, there's three components to the droppings. There's the stool, um, there is the urate. The urate is the white portion of the dropping, and then there's the urine. And the urate with liver disease sometimes changes color. So if you have a bird that had um, uh, white urates, which is what it should be, and then it changes to like a lime green, that's a big indication of liver problems. So that's that's probably our most specific clue that a liver disorder is occurring, is if you see that urate change from white to green or maybe even a slight yellowish color. Um, there is one other problem that can cause that, and that's uh, hemolysis, which is breakdown of red blood cells. But hemolysis problems don't happen very commonly in birds. So probably like, I don't know, 98% of the time that I see um, green or yellowish urates in birds, it's because of liver problems. They may also have diarrhea as another thing, um, but it's not specific. Uh, and then the last thing is sometimes no signs. There's many birds that I have met that the owners haven't known, seen anything. They seem to be totally fine and we just do wellness blood work to just make sure things are functioning okay internally um, associated with our physical exams and it pops up on blood work. Okay, so when we are trying to figure out if a bird has liver problems, uh, you bring your bird to the vet and often the first thing that a veterinarian is going to want to do is blood work. And the reason we want to do blood work is because it allows us to look at certain liver enzymes and liver function tests. Now, I will say there are some times where I have a bird come into the hospital and 
I'm highly suspicious it has liver problems. And I say, you know what? I don't think I want to do blood work today. And the reason I may say that is because if it's a small species and it's very, very suspicious for liver disease based on my physical exam, I might be a little worried about trying to collect a blood sample because if I go to collect that blood sample and that bird isn't clotting its blood very well, if it's a small bird, I have the potential to allow that bird to bleed uncontrollably secondary to my blood draw. Um, and the bird could potentially pass away from a blood draw. Now, it's not super common and it's usually the small species if that's going to happen. But what I mean by that is usually the budgies, um, the cockatiels or the smaller, the smaller conures like the pyrrhora genus conures. Um, and, you know, obviously that's the last thing we want to have happen. So if I'm doing my physical and I'm really suspicious and I'm worried about it, I'll tell an owner, hey, you know what, here's what I think is going on, but let's not check blood work today. And again, most times it's going to be in budgies because I'll see them come in with that elongated beak. It's got those little fissures in it that look like extra flakiness. They'll have the little red or purple spots on the beak, the nails. It may be on the little uh, chubby side. It may have a history of a uh, poor head that's really high in fat. Um, it may have a distended abdomen. If I have a little budgie coming in with all those signs, I'm definitely going to be talking to an owner about liver disease. And we're going to try some treatments first before we confirm our liver problems because I don't want to kill the patient while I'm trying to get a correlation of a diagnosis. That's the last thing we want to have happen. But in most species, we are able to take blood just fine without any problems. Um, and that's where we get our answers as to is there liver disease going on. Um, we also, when we collect a blood sample, we'll do what's called a CBC, that stands for a complete blood count, and we're just looking to see if there's any changes in the red cells or white cells that could potentially lead us in one direction or another as to the underlying reason for why this particular bird has liver problems. And then we may also need to do very specific testing, like testing for infectious diseases. Like we know that the organism chlamydia can cause liver disease. So I may want to test for chlamydia disease. Um, so, and then there's also uh, imaging studies that we can do as well. So uh, imaging studies, there's three different types of imaging studies we can do, or the main ones, I should say. There's, there's other things, but these are the like most common. Uh, radiographs are number one, and in this picture here, I have two different sets of images. This one up at the top here is the lateral uh, image, and the liver is actually situated right here. This is a, a cockatoo, and this is the heart of the cockatoo. This coming down here is uh, the thoracic esophagus going into the proventriculus. Here's the ventriculus that has a little bit of stuff inside of it. So between that ventriculus, that portion of the stomach, and the heart, right between there lies our liver. And on this image here, this is, I forget what species this was. Uh, this might have been a cockatoo as well. Um, but the heart is up here and our ventriculus is down here. So right between the two is our liver. And actually in both of these images, these are normal appearing um, liver silhouettes on an x-ray. They don't look enlarged to me or out of the ordinary. I'm not seeing any displacement of organs. If the liver gets in big, some, big sometimes on this lateral view, you'll see the ventriculus get pushed up and back. And the proventriculus becomes a little bit more visible too because it's also getting pushed up because that liver is taking up more space. And on this image here, we have this, what we call hourglass sort of shape, hourglass silhouette to the heart and uh, liver and um, intestines and ventriculus on either side. And when that liver becomes enlarged, it ends up changing that hourglass shape. And sometimes I'll call it like a pear shape because it looks more, more pear-like. <laughs> or sometimes it, it doesn't even have like, this is portion is called the waist. It doesn't have that waist at all. It's just this like straight thing. Um, so those are uh, clues that we can, um, uh, x-rays, we can, we can use x-rays as a clue to help us figure out sometimes when liver problems are going on. Ultrasound is helpful as well. Now, ultrasounds can be a little difficult in birds because it, birds have air sacs and those air sacs are pretty extensive around their body. And when an ultrasound hits air, it actually throws this sort of impedance image back at, at the 
um, probe. And so it, it, ultrasounds just don't penetrate air well. And so we can't see beyond air, but with where the liver is situated, if you put your probe just right, you can actually get an image of the liver. So that might be necessary or, or something your veterinarian wants to, to do. And then the other thing is CT scans. Um, CT scans are being utilized more and more because they're really quite helpful and they give us a lot more information. The, the downside is they tend to be a bit more expensive um, and they do require anesthesia to, to get the images that we need, but they're pretty short. A, a regular CT scan um, is only going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, when we do contrast, contrast is a dye that we inject into the veins and then we run the CT scan while we're injecting that dye and it helps light up the organs and allows us to see organs with better visualization. That ends up taking a little bit longer, but it only uh, increases the CT scans by a few more minutes. So a lot of times from the time that they're they go under anesthesia to the time that we're done with a CT scan. Sometimes it's only like 15 minutes, 20 minutes maybe, uh, depending upon what images we need. So um, on to the next thing though, sort of the gold standard to help us really know why we have that liver is a biopsy. Um, so say a bird comes into the hospital and there's some signs that are, the owners are seeing that are consistent with liver disease. We run blood, we find that the bird has high liver enzymes. We may do some imaging studies to get an idea of, does it look like there's any enlargement? Does it look like there's any mass effect? Can I see anything else going on elsewhere? testing, but there are many times where to get to the real bottom of the problem, the root cause is a biopsy gets taken. And that's because um, it allows us to uh, get a picture um, of really what's going on at the cellular level. And this image here is a picture of um, a biopsy of the liver. Okay, so uh, the next thing is once we identify what's going on with the liver, well, now we have to treat the liver and we have to find out, um, you know, really uh, what the best treatment is for that specific liver disease that is going on. So if we find that the bird has fatty liver syndrome, then it's going to mean that we need to put that bird on a diet where they are getting lower fat, uh, get them a little bit more exercise, moving around, um, and then we might be doing some general supportive care things as well, which we're going to be talking a little bit more about in a moment. If it turns out the bird has an infectious disease that's causing liver problems, then they may need some antibiotics. Um, if they happen to be a bird who does have some primary uh, fungal infection affecting the liver, then antifungals may be necessary. And when it comes to the viruses that can affect the liver, that becomes a little bit more tough. We don't have great antivirals, so sometimes it's just supportive care. If they have a toxin, such as like a heavy metal toxin that's leading to damage to the liver, then we may need to do chelation therapy, but there's other types of toxins aside from heavy metals where chelation therapy is not going to work. If they are found to have iron storage disease, like my one African gray patient that I have that has iron storage disease, we have to use very specific um, iron binding agents. So they're chelating agents as well. They help bind the iron up in the body and help excrete, the, um, the animal excrete it from their body or means need to do phlebotomies as well, or sometimes a combination of both. And then the other thing uh, that we're going to get more into now um, is just the general supportive care side of things, which is going to be things like milk thistle, silymarin, dandelion root, omega-3 fatty acids. Those things are more along the lines of our nutraceuticals. They're going to be a little bit more broad. They're not as specific for one particular liver problem over another, but they're more generalists that help the liver in a variety of ways. So we'll get into that. So the first one, and the one that most people are gonna be really familiar with if you've ever had a bird with liver problems or know somebody who's had a bird with liver problems, you're often gonna hear that that bird is on milk thistle. Milk thistle is an herb. Um, we mostly use the seed, which is the spiny part of the flower of that, that milk thistle um, plant. And there are three active components within it. There's silly bin, uh, silly Kristen, and silly Dianinin. Together they're just all called the silymarin. 
and what it what this has in it or how it, how it functions is it acts as a hepatoprotective agent those different silymerins in there um, acts as an antioxidant it actually decreases fibrosis of the liver it stimulates regeneration of hepatocytes it increases the flow of bile um, and uh, the secretion as well of bile into the intestines and the main thing we use, of course, liver disease. Um, but how we supplement it in birds is you want to use the liquid. It comes in a variety of different forms. And there's, well, it comes in two forms, I should say. It comes as a liquid or as it comes as a powder. But you really want to use the liquid. And the reason you want to use the liquid is because the powders have been found to be contaminated with other things that aren't supposed to be in there, in particular um, fungal uh, organisms have been found to contaminate milk thistle powders frequently. So because of that, we usually recommend using the, the liquid. A lot of the liquids that are made and are on the market uh, are, they have an alcohol in there or alcohols in there as um, sort of the carrying agent, but they do, there are ones that are made without alcohol and those are the ones that need to be used for birds. Now, you also have to get a really highly concentrated formula of milk thistle in order for it to really be effective, because only 20 to 50% of it gets absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. Now, I will say that's based off of mammalian data. That is not based off of uh, avian data, but we don't have good avian data to really say how much actually gets absorbed. So, okay. However, despite that, there is scientific evidence that you can use it in birds. There have been studies that have been done looking at different liver problems um, and giving milk thistle at, at different quantities and seeing how it affects um, outcome. And so there's some studies in chickens where they gave um, a silymarin phospholipid complex and they looked to see if it could reduce the toxicity of aflatoxin B1 in broiler chicks. So if you remember I was saying that there are certain toxins that can be more commonly found in the poultry industry. Um, well in poultry they some the feed can sometimes easily be contaminated with a um, fungal organism, aspergillus actually, which you'll know about aspergillus or probably have heard about aspergillus in pet birds for respiratory problems, but that aspergillus organism can also contaminate feed. And when it does, sometimes it can produce a toxin and that to toxin is called aflatoxin B1. And if it gets into the feed and you feed it to chickens, it can be real damaging to the liver and it can lead to death in them. Um, so if uh, there was a study done in chickens and they gave the chickens 600 milligrams per kilogram of silymarin after giving them the toxin as well. And they found that compared to birds that did not get the silymarin, they actually were in better body condition, had better feed intake. Um, and further in that particular study, they also did have um, histologic evidence showing that there was less damage to liver cells um, than those that did not get the, the treatment. Um, so a couple other studies that have been done have been done in pigeons and, and um, they've actually looked at it for different toxins. So in, they use that same toxin, the aflatoxin, in a pigeon study, but they did it at a lower dose than the chicken study. So in the chicken study, they used 600 milligrams per kilogram. In the pigeon study, they used 100 milligrams per kilogram. And at 100 milligrams per kilogram for the aflatoxin, they found that it really didn't work. It didn't have any hepatoprotective effect. Um, so interestingly that um, you can see different benefits with, with different doses, which I guess isn't really actually too interesting because when it comes to medications, we know we have to have the correct dose for something to actually work appropriately. But what is interesting is in a different study where they actually looked at acetaminophen induced um, toxicity and changes to the liver and also the kidneys. When they gave the same uh, silymarin, they did show it had hepatoprotective effects, but they actually gave it at a lower dose uh, than that 100 milligrams per kilogram. They gave it at 35 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and in that study, there was no necrosis or vascularization of cells compared to control birds. The liver enzymes didn't rise as much. So it's a different toxin, requires a different dose of the medication to be effective. So kind of interesting. And, and I think that's one of the problems with milk thistle, where you'll hear 
sometimes people say, well, it doesn't really do anything. And other people say, yes, it does do something. Well, it's because <laughs> since we know there's so many different liver problems that are out there in so many different ways, uh, different things affecting the liver, it depends on what's affecting the liver. It depends on the dose that you're giving as to whether or not it's going to be able to be effective. All right, so the next thing is dandelion. Uh, dandelion, the root is kind of a thing that we're a little bit more interested, in, but you can actually use both the root and the leaves um, to have some beneficial effects. The root and leaves contain certain vitamins and minerals, which is great, but the roots really help stimulate the production of bile. It helps remove toxins from, from the body, um, and it also reestablishes re -establishes electrolyte and hydration balance. And then um, interestingly, the leaves also act as a digestive stimulant and a diuretic. So that's something that's important to know because if you do have a bird that has liver disease and your veterinarian decides to put them on like a combination of milk thistle and dandelion, because some veterinarians will do combinations, some will just do one over another, you might find that the birds that are getting uh, dandelion leaves as part of their supplementation are gonna have a little bit more um, wateriness to their droppings. But sometimes that's important, especially if we have these, some of these birds who are having uh, ascites, which is that fluid that's built up in the in the liver, or I'm sorry, not in the liver, but because of liver damage and that albumin um, being lower, having fluid build up within the salomic cavity, sometimes a diuretic can be a little bit helpful for them. Um, there are some studies in birds again, which is great, uh, that do show it, there are effects. Uh, again, we're, it was a study that was done in chickens, and you're going to find that a lot of our studies out there are going to be in chickens or pigeons, and that's because those birds are a little bit easier to maintain for research purposes than, than parrots. Um, there are certain studies out there in parrots, and I'm even going to talk about one in a moment for a different thing, but you're going to find most stuff is in in chickens and, and pigeons. So, but what they did is they looked at the effect of feeding different levels of dandelion leaf powder on the uh, in the diet and the production and physiologic performance in broiler chickens. And they found that those birds that did have dandelion leaf powder did have a decrease in cholesterol and an increase in the antioxidant enzymes in the serum of birds getting the highest levels of dandelion leaf because that particular study they looked at different levels of it in the diet. So it can have some beneficial effects. And if we have a bird who has high cholesterol because of liver problems, which is something that we will see, um, this might be helpful for them. Okay, another thing is omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, what are fatty acids? Well, fatty acids are fats. Uh, they get their classification as omega-3 or omega-6 based on a certain chemical bond. Um, and differences in this chemical bond are important. Uh, that's why I bring it up because they behave differently. Omega-3s behave differently from omega-6s in the body. Omega-3 fatty acids are also known as linolenic acid. Omega-6 fatty acids are linoleic uh, acid. And omega-3s have more of a anti-inflammatory effect on the body, whereas omega-6s have a little higher potential to lead to inflammation in the body. So we generally want less inflammation in the body for many reasons. Um, and so oftentimes omega-3s are going to be, we want omega-3s as higher amounts in our diets and supplements to help reduce inflammation within the body. And different sources of omega-3 fatty acids are gonna be things like fish oil, krill oil, flaxseed, chia seed, or walnuts. And when we supplement this to birds, um, we can use just the oils themselves. We can use fish oil or flax oil, or you can use um, milled flaxseed or crushed flaxseed, but it does have to be crushed up. If you're using the like flaxseed, I mean, you can use those, but it's not going to be as effective as if it's ground down or if you're actually using the oil just because of the concentration. You're gonna have it in much higher concentrations. Um, when and more bioavailable um, when you have it as the milled product as opposed to the whole seed. The great news is, is there is some scientific evidence for the use of omega-3 fatty acids in birds and there was a study in cockatiels where they looked at um, different types of omega-3 fatty acids and also an omega-6 fatty acid too and, and looked at what their fat levels were in the blood and they looked at 
fish oil, they looked at flaxseed oil, um, and they looked at, at beef tallow. And they did find that those birds that were supplemented with fish oil, um, which again is one of our omega-3 fatty acids, that there was a reduction um, in fat levels within circulation. And so since we know that liver disease can cause an increase in fat levels, uh, because if the liver isn't functioning as well as it's supposed to, um, it may potentially lead to overproduction of fats or because we have fatty liver syndrome uh, in our birds causing them to have liver disease, it may be an important thing to try to help lower those fats um, and may have you know, the benefits of reducing inflammation for them as well. So. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, and I'm going to pull up the chat function here so I can answer the questions people have. Um, all right, so I'm going to go to the top here. Mm. We found out my cockatiel Misty had liver disease when she had persistent blood oozing from her colic after hysterectomy. Yeah, so, and, and sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes, you know, they may seem to be fine in other ways or we're doing something else and, and we end up identifying liver disease um, when events like that occur. All right, and then let's see. Yeah. The I just to say with that, by the way, the, the problem is that when uh, a small bird needs major surgery like that, they don't tend to take blood ahead of time because that will deplete them too much Right. Surgery. Whereas if it were a larger bird, they would have taken blood ahead of time, seen that she had a climbing disorder and not done the surgery in the first place. Right. Exactly. And sometimes if we're, well, if we are lucky and it's not an emergency situation, then we try to draw blood uh, before surgeries and, you know, a few weeks before surgeries, giving them time to replenish their, um, replenish their blood so they have enough for us if there is anything that's going to go wrong during surgery. But in certain emergency situations, the bird's pretty sick, it needs to get into surgery now, we, we may not have the benefit of being able to draw blood on them beforehand. So just one of the difficulties with those little, little ones. All right, um, can you comment on seed versus pellet and recommended pellet? I know it's a hot topic. Prior cockatiel had fatty liver disease and had been on seed diet, changed to pellet at 13 years old and he lived until 24 and a half. That's great. Um, have baby two years old, pellet diet with veggies, chop, et cetera. Vet does not believe in doing seed. Lots of opinions along with what pellet currently is supreme natural, though he's not a huge pellet eater. Okay, so, um, you know, when it comes to seeds and pellets, definitely we know that if a bird is on all seeds, it is going to be at a higher risk for liver disease, particularly fatty liver syndrome. Now, for some of our smaller species, and if we're particularly talking about a cockatiel, um, I do like them to have some seed in the diet. If they are one of the color varieties, which most of them are, if they're kind of anything other than a standard gray wild type cockatiel, I like them to be getting not 100% pellets, Definitely not 100% seeds, <laughs> oh, um, but some seeds mixed in with a more pelleted diet. And the reason for that is not because of liver disease, but because of kidney disease. In some individuals, and we haven't figured it out yet, but in some individuals that are the color variety, either cockatiel, budgie, parrotlet, or lovebird, if they're not their wild type coloration, if you give them all pellets, some of them will go on to develop kidney problems. So uh, because of that, for those smaller guys, we do, rec or not everybody, but I, I do recommend they get some seed in the diet, but also offering the veggies, the chop, that sort of stuff is good to do um, so, to provide them with more variety. So that's still true with pellets. I know that was a problem about 20, 25 years ago. I thought they, they had fixed that with formulations with them, with birds going on to develop kidney problems? Right. No, no, we haven't even figured out what it is oh, wow. in, the, in the pellets that makes those color variety individuals have that problem. So, and again, it goes back, it's the color variety one. So if you have a standard gray wild type cockatiel, um, 
you're fine. You can feed them all pellets. They don't seem to be prone to it. And it's not going to happen in every single color variety either, you know, but also I've known many, many birds who have been on all seed diets and, you know, cockatiels that are in their late twenties. And despite, uh, you know, the veterinary world thinking that they're going to go on and have liver problems, they don't. So there's always outliers out there that make us scratch our heads and wonder like, why isn't this happening to you? <laughs> but, you know, it's a good thing when disease isn't happening, of course. The, the problem is also with the cocktails, the, the quote unquote uh, wild type, it, from what I've read, there are very few of them actually left. So even though your bird may look like they're the wild coloration, I, I've read that almost all cocktails, at least in the U.S. now, do have a mixture of, of uh, genetics. That it, because the normal gray may be dominant, but that they still carry a lot of the uh, genetic issues associated with the the different colored mutations. Yeah, I, I would believe that there's that's probably the case. But because we still don't know what it is, I mean, all we can really say is that there is something about a full pelleted diet that leads some individuals of when they exhibit that color variety to the development of kidney disease. So, and I don't know, you know, hopefully one day we will figure it out, but I don't know if we ever will. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's one of those things that we need, we need more research and we need somebody who can dedicate the time to that particular research in such a, such a little um, niche area of interest that I hope one day somebody's able to conquer that. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if we will figure it out. And that's one of the reasons I, I use Avocakes as my base diet, because it is a mixture of seeds and pellets and, uh, and lots of healthy stuff in there and the birds love it and everything. And my yeah. cocktails are all very elderly. So I, I must be doing, <laughs> uh, I, you know, there's another avian vet who, who did her uh, a research study many years ago. She's talked to the club before about, um, uh, she did a research study on avocates and found that they uh, turned out to be a really excellent diet. And because I, I've had some people say, well, you know, you're still feeding your birds some seed by giving them them avocates. And I said, it's true, but as cockatiels and with the kidney issues, I think it's okay. Everything has shown me. I just wish that that the fever would, would make a senior version like they do with the nutriberries and, and put all those healthy nutraceuticals that you talked about in the advocates too, not just the nutriberries. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe one day they will, who knows? <laughs> but I, I agree, it would be nice to have that as the Ada cake, so. Maybe you can mention it to them since yeah. we're all <laughs> still a fever, so. Yeah. Um, okay, and then I see another question, how about sprouted seeds? Is sprouted chia seed also a good source of omega-3? Yeah, sprouted seeds, I'm, I'm very happy to have people do that as well. And the chia seeds is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. I'm, I'm always promoting people to chia pets and they, they look at me like I have, I have three heads, but, but chia pets are just, all they are are sprouted chia seeds. And they're, because of the way the chia pet is constructed, you don't end up with mold or any of the other problems that, that plague you when you try to sprout seeds. So you know, you plant a chia pet and you can go for weeks with fresh chia sprouts. And yeah. I can tell you, my birds love it. They, they go over and they chew on it. So it's sort of an easy and fun way to sprout chia seeds without the mold problem. And I just want to make sure when, when they do sprout, they still retain the omega-3. I believe they do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they do. And um, you, you bring up a good point of using the chia, the chia pet because it provides not only nutrition, but you're also providing fun you know, you're providing a foraging opportunity. So you're not only taking care of their nutritional health, you're taking care of their mental health too. So. <laughs> yeah. Someone says, you literally just grow a chia pet. Yes, you literally just grow a chia pet. And, you know, when you run out of seeds, you don't have to go buy their expensive packets. Just go to any health food store and, you know, supermarket and just buy a bag of chia seeds. You can get like thousands of chia seeds for, a, you know, a few dollars. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm always doing chia seed tutorials on um, on Twitter. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, and then I see. Uh, do you suggest omega three uh, fatty acids even when no problems are known? Honestly, I do. Um, I use them for my own birds. Um, they get a little bit on top of their pellets pretty much daily um, because of the benefits that they have for other 
body systems, particularly the cardiovascular system. There are studies that have been done that have looked at birds after they've passed away and they compared the omega-3 fatty acid content in the muscles. And there's a correlation between if you have higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids in muscles, you actually have lower atherosclerosis lesions within vessels. And so there probably is some, you know, preventative properties uh, with those omega-3 fatty acids to the development of atherosclerosis, which we know is becoming more and more of a problem in our pet birds. We see it mu much more frequently than we used to. Um, so absolutely, I think it's beneficial for, for other uses than just um, this particular problem. Um, and then I see this other question, can milk this be harmful if taken long-term for uh, small birds? Um, you know, I don't, I have never known a bird to have problems associated with taking milk thistle long-term. Um, there was somewhere that I thought I had read that in healthy chickens, if they got really high levels of milk thistle, it could potentially cause problems. But I went back to the literature. I thought I had read that somewhere. went back to the literature, tried to search for it, and could not find it anywhere. So I think I might have read something wrong because I, I have tried to search for that many, many times and have come up with nothing. So uh, that being said, in my search for trying to find something about liver uh, um, milk thistle use long term, and if it has any negative effects, I haven't come across anything, nor have I experienced anything um, clinically in practice. Therefore, it would lead me to believe that it should be pretty healthy long term without any issues. Um, am I willing to comment on pellet brand Zupreme, Lefebvre's tops and seed? Uh, oh, I can comment. It's okay. Um, so, you know, to be 100% honest, I don't really have a particular brand of pellet that I like over another. Um, and the reason for that is because I think any pellet is better than no pellet for the most part compared to being on an all seed diet. Um, and I really think it depends on the individual bird and their preference as to which one I'm going to feed them. I mean, with my own birds, I routinely feed um, Harrison's, Lefebvre's, Tops, and Oven Fresh Bites. Every once in a while, I'll do Zupreme. Um, so that's five different types of brands of pellets that I use on my own birds. <laughs> so I, I really can't say that I've seen in my you know clinical practice either, there really being any major differences amongst them. Of course, it's like <clears throat> any other food I, and in any other species, you're going to have people who are really um, in liking one particular type over another for one reason over another. But I've seen birds do well on all those different diets. And I think nutrition is very, or has the potential to be very unique to each individual. So, you know, I want, all I, I, what I will say is that I want them to be on some pellet in the diet, but I really don't mind which one it is that they are on. I'm just going to so what do you think is the best way to give daily um, omega-3 supplementation? You said you do that with your birds. Are you sprinkling yeah. some food or... Usually what I do is I get the capsules of fish oil and I chose the, because you can use flax oil. And again, there's a variety of different ones as I mentioned, but I use the fish oil because of the studies that were done in cockatiels that showed that um, when the cockatiels got it, they had lower levels of fats in circulation. And I have African greys, Amazons, I have a con, I have a conure, but African greys and Amazons, they're the like number one and number two poster children for cardiovascular disease. And so because I have those particular species, I want to go with something that I know is going to lower fat levels. So that's why I choose the fish oil. I use the capsules because if you get the fish oil that's like in a, um, uh, like in a bottle and you just squirt it out from the bottle, the problem is, is it oxidizes over time and it goes bad. And so it's going to go bad way earlier than, you know, you're going to go through it. Whereas when you're using it for those capsules, since it's you know, in an oxygen-free environment, it is not going to get oxidized. It's not going to go bad quickly. 
So I just poke a hole in a capsule once a day and I squirt it on top of several pellets so that I know they're probably not getting every last little drop that I give them, but I know that they're getting some of it. And so, you know, that chronic use over time, uh, I, you know, my hope is that I'll be lowering um, the chances of atherosclerosis for my birds. <laughs> how, how, do you, um, how do you know how much to squirt? Oh, okay. So there is a, there is a um, milligram or milliliter per kilogram dosage, and it's 0.22 mils per kilogram of body weight. Um, now, the amount that I squirt out on the, the pellets is much more than that because I know that they're probably going to be dropping some of it. But generally speaking, if, I, if I'm dosing it to an, like telling an owner how much to dose to their bird, um, and they want to give it directly by mouth, because when I'm talking with owners, I tell them you can give it directly by mouth, and some people want to do it that way, or some people do it the way that I do it, because I'm using it more for preventative purposes right now, um, is I just put it on the food. But for a cockatiel, you're usually looking at like 0.04 to 0.05 milliliters a day for, which is, ends up being like two to three drops. Um, if we are talking about like an African gray or Amazon sized bird, it's usually like 0.08 to 0.1 mils, which is gonna be somewhere around like, I don't know, like seven to eight drops around there. Um, and if we're talking about a, a macaw, then it's going to be somewhere around like 0.2 milliliters a day. So I tend to give double that when I'm squirting it out on top of pellets in the hopes that, you know, again, I'm, I know that they're probably dropping some of it. Uh, but I also am a little bit more like, I measure out how much I give my birds per day um, so that I know how much they're eating. And I only give them extra stuff once they are done and they've kind of cleaned everything up. <laughs> because I also allow my birds to go to the bottom of their cage and forage and, and get stuff off the bottom of the cage. Um, so because I kind of tightly regulate how much I'm actually giving them, I can feel a little bit more confident knowing that they're probably getting the majority of what I am offering. Yeah, I guess that's a little bit hard if you're you're like a lot of people who just have bowl of pellets, or in my case, bowl of advocates and you don't really know how much they're eating, what they're eating from. There's, there's no way to be sure they would be getting that dose. Right. So, and that's where then some people want to just give it directly by mouth and that's totally fine to do as well. Or they can put it on a treat that the, you know the bird's going to eat that treat. Um, that's what it gets the first thing of the day. I, I do have some clients that do that as well as they just put it on a favorite treat. That's the first thing they get and then they put their bowl of food out later on. Do they seem to like it or do they avoid it or uh, do uh, they, like if you put it on pellets, would they eat every pellet but that one? Or, you or know, it, like it? interestingly, I think when owners give it directly by mouth, that's probably when I hear the most like uh, the bird didn't really like it so much. But when they put it on food, I, I haven't had owners uh, seem to complain that their bird isn't taking it so much. And in fact, uh, one of my birds, my, one of my friends, I had her put her bird on it recently. And she was like, I don't know. He's so picky. I really am not sure. Um, and she sent me a text message the next day saying, oh my God, he totally ate the whole thing. I didn't even expect this. Like he didn't even act like there was anything on there. It went totally fine. So um, I, I haven't had a lot of people come back, come back and say that it's been a problem versus some other medications. I'll tell you for sure. There are times when, um, uh, an owner comes back for a follow-up and they're like, oh my God, the bird hated the medication. I don't know how much of it I actually got into them. You know, I, I hear that a bit, but I haven't had that so much with the fish oil. Yeah. The problem is when you're giving medication, because my birds are on medication. I've met many birds that I've had to medicate over the years. It's the whole process of the of doing the medicating that I think they hate more than the medicine itself. Sure, yeah. It can be very stressful. You know? So is there, is there any, you know, I'm guessing there's probably no like powdered form you could mix in with food or well, if you choose to use flaxseed, then you can get the ground up flaxseed and you can put that in with, with food. And does that have a certain dosage or just sort of sprinkle it in because it's, it, it probably yeah, not a dose of flaxseed? Yeah, that one I don't have a good dose for, for people. So it's just sprinkled in. 
Um, there are, I know there are some products that are out there on the market. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it. I think it's, I forget the name of it, but there is a product that you can sometimes get at stores that have bird supplies. Um, oh, I think it's called the missing link or something like that. And that's a ground flax seed. Um, and they do have like a little dosing on the back of their product that says how much to give, but I don't know what they have that based off of, to be completely honest. I, I'm, I'm unaware of any particular studies. I could probably find something in chickens because again, there's so many studies on chickens, but I don't know of any particular studies on actual dosing in parrots. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I have picked up some flaxseed tips for my birds and they don't like it. None of them will eat. Oh, really? None of them will eat the flaxseeds. So I suppose like if it were ground up and mixed into their food, they probably wouldn't notice it, but they wouldn't eat a whole flaxseed. Yeah. Of course, like if you're doing a chia pet, there's, there's obviously no way to determine dosage. You don't even know how much you're eating because they're just sort of nibbling on it and everything. But, but as, you know, any... Any omega-3s can be better than no omega-3s. So. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because my birds all love fish. So, like, if I'm making a piece of salmon, and I do make salmon. Uh -huh. Salmon is very <laughs> omega-3. They right. gobble it up. They all get a little bit of piece of fish, and they love it. So that's another way you can get you can get fish oil into your birds, literally by giving them fish. Right. Yeah. Especially, you know, oil, oily fishes like uh, that or sardines or mackerel. Right. Right. Very interesting. And then what about um, um, the dandelion um, or the, uh, oh, actually I should say the milk thistle. Um, do you feel they should have that as a preventative also? You know, I don't think it hurts, but I don't know that it's necessary. I, I, I feel comfortable saying the omega-3s can be great as a preventative because we have data to support that. I don't feel as comfortable saying that for the, for milk thistle because you know, as I mentioned, it really depends on like what the toxin was, what the dose was as to whether or not it was effective. And so I don't think it's going to hurt because I haven't really, again, in searching for the, I, like I said, I thought there was one paper that I had read one time about chickens too much milk thistle could be a problem, but I tried to search for it again and could not find anything. I, I really have not find any, found anything to support it being a problem. So I don't think it would hurt to give it as a preventative, but I don't know that it would really I don't know that it would really do anything as a preventative. So. And the, and the studies were all on aflatoxin. So we, we right. just know it helps with aflatoxin in chickens, but we and, don't, we and, don't know if it does anything for other forms of liver disease though, right? Uh, for acetaminophen toxicity as well was the other one. But as far as like studies specific to like fatty liver syndrome, which is the most common problem that we see in birds, you know, our pet birds, no, we don't have any particular studies to definitively support that. But that particular syndrome is, is a little hard. We don't have a great, um, like so you first you have to, if we really wanted to have a good study, you know, we'd have to induce fatty liver syndrome in a set of parrots, which we probably could easily do, but somebody would first have to like, you know, do the studies to figure out how much could we give, how much uh, fat do we need to add in their diet to get them to get fatty liver syndrome in this particular species? And then we would have to have com controls and those that were uh, not controls, uh, you know, getting the product. And then you do have to, if we really want to see uh, how it's affecting them, um, you know, they have to have they have to have necropsies and biopsies done, you know? And so that means you're having to euthanize them and um, take tissue samples, which, you know, is valuable information, but then you get into the ethics of, should we do that? And that's why we find that chickens and pigeons, not that in my opinion, they're any less of birds. I love chickens and pigeons as much as I love parrots, um, but they have, they're easier for most researchers to keep. Um, they are shorter lived species. Um, in reality, there are, people are less attached to chickens and pigeons than they are to parrots, you know? So um, when people are doing these sorts of research, they have to go through IACUC committees at different universities, you know, to try and get research passed. And so, and I cook committees are composed of not only veterinarians and, and scientists, they're, com they're composed of um, 
you know, people within the community who, who don't have a particular scientific interest uh, looking to see should we do these sort of things. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot more on the ethics side of things that comes into play that sometimes stops some of these particular types of research from being done and, and leaves us scratching our heads. <laughs> well, they do have that cockatoo flock and the orange fronted Amazon flock at, uh, at University of San Diego that they do do these studies on. Yeah. Yeah. So. There are certain universities that do have different, different uh, groups, but yeah. So there's just a lot more involved with it that, again, we also just need people who are in those settings who have the funding to be able to support doing the studies too. So yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of interesting with fatty liver because it's, it's, it's a huge problem with humans too, especially as people uh, have been gaining weight over the, over the decades in the U.S. and in other countries. So there's, it's actually a tremendous, <clears throat> excuse me, a tremendous area of research in humans and looking for drugs that can reverse. And you know, a lot as you know, a lot of these drugs eventually end up trickling down to to companion animals, including birds, yeah. and they differ. So there is hope that drugs will be developed. But uh, I, I did ask this question when, when I heard you give the talk to Lefebvre, um, because they, milk thistle has been a big subject of interest with humans too, for, for fatty uh -huh. liver, uh, liver diseases. And they have, over the last, say, five years or so, finally done a series of studies definitively showing that it does not help the liver, uh, for fatty liver and other sort of common liver things. Um, I'm sure they didn't study it in, in aflatoxin and um, they probably didn't study it in acetaminophen toxicity because there would be no ethical way to do that. Right. Uh, so, um, but in terms of fatty liver and other liver diseases, they did determine that it does not actually help. So obviously birds have a different uh, pathophysiology, but it, it does make you wonder about that, but, but there is hope because they are doing a lot of research studies for humans. So if they find something that really does help fatty liver in humans, it's possible it may be able to be adapted to birds. Uh, but the other thing I, uh, I also want to say, which is really interesting is that, you know, in humans, um, they, they can follow the status of the fatty liver with ultrasound. And there's another type of test that, a non-invasive test that measures the liver elasticity, which is sort of a marker for how fatty it is. And they do follow people with this now because say, for example, if somebody has a gastric bypass, they want to know, does the fatty liver go away when they lose weight? Or, or do you still keep it? Because skinny people can also have fatty liver. It's not restricted just to, to heavier people. Uh, right. so, and they also, obviously, they're doing these studies on different medications to help fatty liver and they need a non-invasive way to follow it. So you can follow these things. And as ultrasound does become more common in birds, particularly with the larger species, maybe we will be able to follow birds, let's say with milk thistle or omega-3 or something else to see if birds that have more of it do have less fatty liver as time goes on, rather than the, you know have to kill them and, and do, do a necropsy on their liver. So, you know, maybe these things will be coming down the pipe for birds. Right, right. Potentially. How, how long does it take? So if a bird, baby bird, once it's weaned, is on an all-seed diet, a really crappy diet, and they don't get veggies and all that, how long would it take for them, you think, on average, to develop fatty liver? Well, it's going to depend on the species. So I would say in your budgies, we're usually seeing it develop by like two years of age. And this is in, you know, in clinical practice. Um, so by about two years of age, I've two, three, somewhere around there. Um, but for cockatiels, they'll go for longer. Like your cockatiels, a lot of times it's not till like eight till 10 years, to eight to 10 years of age. And then your Amazons, they're like often in their teens um, or even 20s sometimes before they're starting to have problems. Okay, actually, that's really good to know because we, um, uh, the club had to take in a flock of budgies recently as a rescue. And um, one of them, I think they're, they're all like about, they're, they're all very young. And there was one that was about maybe two years old, came from a big inbreeding situation. So you know the genetics aren't going to be good. But there was one that was maybe two or three at most who died. And she was taken for necropsy and she came back with, with, fatty liver and bad liver is probably one of the causes of death. 
And I thought that was incredibly early for a bird to develop fatty liver and die, but because I know cockatiels, it's a good 10 years. But, so I didn't realize they can develop it after two years. So that probably, um, maybe the sea diet really was the cause of this young bird's death. Yeah. And probably some genetics from inbreeding too, I'm sure. Right, right. Interesting, very interesting. Hmm. Do uh, some people have some, some other questions they'd like to ask? We, we have this fabulous avian vet here you can ask anything you want to right now about, about the liver. All right, well, I'm gonna ask a question about Topsen because this actually came up, friends of ours, their cockatiel um, had had runny stool. The, the bird is, uh, let's see, the bird's six years old now. They adopted the bird when it was, um, I wanna say about three or so. The birds had runny stools forever. They did the million, the literal mil, million, well, not literal, but they did the million dollar workup because everyone was convinced the bird had kidney disease and went to a specialist center in Canada and all that, and it, it wasn't. And uh, they couldn't find any solution for this. And um, I, I said, well, you know, why don't you try Tops, the rice diet? Uh, there are a couple of other brands, but they couldn't get them in Canada. Tops, Tops was the only one they could get. And they put the bird on tops and it all resolved. So I, I'm just curious because, you know, I know tops has been, and, uh, and other rice-based diets that are missing the standard allergens have been helpful for some feather plucking birds. I was just curious in your experience, um, if you've had many birds with various medical problems, have their problems get better or resolve once they were switched to a rice-based diet? I've had some, you know, and this is why I think when people ask me, you know, do, is there a particular pellet that I like, you know, one over another, I really don't feel like I can say I like one particular one over another, because I really believe that nutrition is an individual, um, it needs to be geared towards the individual, you know, uh, and, and maybe that's, because some of my own biases, you know, I've got my own allergens and issues with foods that I can't eat certain things, you know, uh, that yeah. many other people can eat just fine. Uh, but, you know, you see that in our, in our pets too, where certain individuals, you know, many individuals would do fine on this one particular thing, but then this individual does so poorly and you swap it over to some completely different type of pellet and they do so much better. So, it, I, I have seen that. I wouldn't say that I've seen it enough to make me say we all need to switch to this one particular brand, you know, but I, I definitely think it's worth it in, in doing, uh, you know, feeding trials um, with animals when they do have different problems that we're not getting to the bottom of, you know, where, okay, this individual is having something going on, all the tests are coming up fine, you know, maybe we need to just change something up in the diet and see what difference it could make. I, I for sure have had it happen in a few patients where it's been quite helpful just making that change. And then, you know, it, as a veterinarian, it makes me go, gosh, I wish I would have thought of that sooner, <laughs> you know, uh, instead of having the owners go through sometimes, you know, expensive tests or, you know, the patients having to go through testing and x-rays or what, what have you. But um, it's just one of the difficulties of medicine. No, no, no two individuals are the same. <laughs> Plus, it's always the possibility you buy them, the buy the bird, the diet, and they don't want to eat it because they don't like it too. Yep, for sure. I mean, there are the, um, who is it? Um, there were two other brands of rice diet, Rowdy Bush. Rowdy Bush had a rice diet, but they stopped making it. I don't know why. Because a lot of people, Rowdy Bush you could get anywhere. So that was the one people usually tried first. Tops can be a lot more difficult to locate. Uh, yeah. So, and, and then um, um, F, F, FM Brown actually has a rice-free diet, but nobody knows about this. I only know that because they sent samples as a donation to us for a previous event. And mm. one particular line of food, I looked at it and I'm like, this is again, it, it, you know, it's, it's peanut-free, it's wheat-free, it's uh, soy-free, it's, it's a rice-based diet. And it, it's completely different from Topps and Rowdy Bush was completely different. So all three formulations are totally different. So if one doesn't work, it's very much worth 
trying one of the others because they're they're definitely not comparable. The only thing they have in common is that they're rice based and they don't have the three major potential allergens. But this FM Brown brand, they they don't even advertise it for that purpose. It's just one of their lines. And I don't think anybody knows about it, but I, I actually gave some of it to a friend of mine who had a feather plucking African gray. The birds stopped plucking. So right. Um, but but nowadays, you know, uh, with rowdy bush gone, it's just that much harder to try these things. But but again, you know, I agree with you. If some if nothing is showing up, I mean, what's the harm of trying another diet? So it cost you, you know, ten or twenty bucks to get a small bag and and give right. it on. Um, you know, some of the manufacturers do have samples. I know Lefebvre, you can actually. Uh, you can ask them for a sample pack of a number of their products and they'll send you a little bag of everything. I right. don't think the other manufacturers do that. I, I wish they did be, you know, birds are so picky about pellet diets. It would be really nice if somebody, it could even be an independent source, put together well, a, a box where it had a small bag of like 10 different brands. So you could try your, your bird on them and not have to waste a ton of money just to find out what they like in general. Right. There's actually a, a bird store um, in Phoenix, close to where the hospital is, where I work, that they um, will open up bags of food and they'll sell them in like, um, you know, like when you go to certain grocery stores, how you have the like grains and stuff like in a right. bin and you can use a little scoop and like get out what you want. They'll do that with, with pellets. And it's kind of nice because I can advise people to, Hey, go over to go over there, pick out a few different ones, see what your bird likes and then stick with that. So I do see another qu uh, question came up over in the corner here about the um, really high AST and bile acids. And if there's any way of knowing how long, uh, liver disease was present with values at that level. You know, honestly, um, because, it, because the AST was high, the AST, that enzyme usually goes up when there's more kind of acu acute liver damage. Um, so either this was a new problem that was developing or it was an acute on chronic change. Uh, so it doesn't exactly answer your question, but um, the bile acids, honestly, that can, can go up and can go up high rather quickly and stay high for a prolonged period of time. But the AST is your one there that there has to have been some recent liver damage for that enzyme to leak out and have it be elevated. But then the one other caveat to that is muscle damage will also cause your AST value to be high. So it can sometimes confuse the veterinarian because sometimes we may see really high AST values and go, well, is it muscle damage or is it the liver? Um, so the combination of those two together, AST and bile acids, is really what's most helpful to, to let us know um, that we ha really have some liver problems going on. And in humans, if you see very high AST, it it means alcohol, so. Oh yeah. <laughs> which pro should, probably isn't a problem for the bird unless they got into your drink, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so Chris brought up, I was actually gonna mention too, uh, anyone who's in uh, New Jersey near the Philadelphia area, just right over the border, Bird Paradise is set up that way also with bins. So you can you can actually buy any side, you, you know, you just, they, they've got those giant, uh, bins and you can pour the pellets into the cups so you can try a lot that way. Uh, but I, I don't think, I don't know, Chris, can you, I don't think you can buy like smaller samples of that online though. I think you have to go there in person to do it. No, you can order them online. You So you could order just a small amount then? Um, well, the smallest is a pound. A pound, okay. Well, that's still, that's still better than buying like a, you know, five or 10 pound bag of some particular brand just to try it. So, so that's good to know. And Bird Paradise always has sales. So um, if you just Google them, you could go and that way you could try different pellets. When we used to go to Parapalooza before the pandemic, um, because it's, it's not just pellets and foods. I mean, you can chamomile leaves. I mean, pretty much any bird treat, anything is in these bins and you, they give you, you can take free, they give you free samples. So you have these small cups. So I'd always just fill them up and bring home you know, 10, 20 different little samples of different fruits or dried veggies or, or treats or whatever. 
um, because my birds don't generally like that stuff. So this way I could try all these things to see if they liked any of them. So yeah, after, so that, that's a great benefit of bird paradise. And, uh, oops. oh yeah, this, right. Yeah, I didn't think bird paradise uh, was resuming it. They used to send a bus for us and um, which was a great trip, but that's all gone by the wayside for now. All right, uh, Kim, do you have any other questions? Or if you're still with us, Kim. Uh, let's see, let me just see if Kim's still there. Oh, it looks like she left. Yeah, she, she had some liver problems with her bird recently. So I know she asked some questions earlier. Okay, um, yeah, Bonnie, we may have. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Um, and Dr. Lamb also gave a talk to Lefebvre on Friday about kidney issues. I haven't watched that yet, but I plan to, but uh, I'm sure it's fabulous. So I encourage everybody to watch that. Lefebvre has a tremendous amount of really excellent videos. If they're all, every, all their talks are recorded. So if you can't make them, I encourage you to go. Uh, they've done a whole series now on um, avian ganglioneuritis, um, which, which has been absolutely fabulous. Um, yeah, those ones have been very nice. Yeah, it, it's, they're really important because especially when they talk about the testing, because it's a lot of what they say is at odds with what the avian vets in practice will tell you. So, um, but that's their actual research subject and that's what they, that's what they spend all their time doing. So um, it's important to understand what the tests are and which ones should actually be ordered to see if your bird has it. And um, so I highly encourage everybody to watch those as well. And Really, all the talks are quite good. I'm not. I'm not showing for Lefebvre. They're just an excellent uh, series of talks there. So, all right. Does any, anybody else have any other questions? All right. I'm going to uh, turn off the recording now. I want to thank everybody for coming. <laughs>